Welcome to Basic Black. Some of you are joining us on our broadcast and others of you are joining us on our digital platforms. I'm Callie Crossley, host of Under the Radar 89.7. Tonight, the legacy of Lonnie Guineer and Bell Hooks. We, like you, are dealing with the effects of the coronavirus pandemic and are taking precautions. We are working with limited staff and our guests are joining us remotely. We lost them too soon. Two black women powerhouses in law and literature who used their talents in the fight for justice for African Americans. Harvard Law professor Lonnie Guineer and acclaimed writer Bell Hooks were pathbreakers, rising to the top of their fields despite formidable racist barriers. Now, Lonnie Guineer and Bell Hooks are among the ancestors, and we admirers of their outstanding intellectual and cultural contributions pay tribute. Joining us remotely, Margaret Burnham, professor of law and Africana studies and founder and director of the Civil Rights and Restorative Justice Project at Northeastern University. Kim McLaren, professor and interim dean of graduate and professional studies at Emerson College. Marita Rivero, principal of Rivero Partners. Ms. Rivero is also the former director of the Museum of African American History and the former VP and GM for radio and television at GBH. And Darren Duarte, Director of Communications and Outreach, Brockton Police Department, and a former host of Say Brother and Basic Black. Welcome to you all. So <laughs> let me just do just the briefest um, bio of each of the women so that we can all be on the same page, not you, but let's invite our audience in. Um, so Bell Hooks and Lonnie Guineer were multi-hyphenate before we were using that term. They each had many things uh, going on. Bell Hooks um, was a scholar, an activist, an author, including a children's book author and a public intellectual. Time Magazine called her a rock star public intellectual, though that was a term that Bell herself didn't feel exactly comfortable with, but there you have it. Lonnie Guineer was called a towering intellectual. She was also a scholar and activist. She is the first and only uh, black woman tenured at Harvard Law School. Um, she uh, is perhaps uh, sadly best known for a controversy mm -hmm. which ensued after President uh, Bill Clinton nominated her in 1998 uh, to be the Assistant Attorney General for the Civil Rights Department of the Justice Department um, and then withdrew it. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But those are just the briefest um, outlines of their careers and histories, their life and their legacies. And I want to start this way because it shouldn't have been surprising, but it's interesting to note that every single one of you used the word courage when describing both of them. So let's start with Lonnie. Margaret, why courage when you talk about Lonnie Guineer? Well, Lonnie was, uh, first of all, cor courageous in her litigation uh, strategies uh, at the LDF. She started at the Legal Defense Fund. That was uh, really her first job after her clerkship. Uh, and she tried uh, uh, voting rights cases really all over the South uh, and uh, and confronted, you know, uh, deeply uh, resistant systems of, uh, of uh, disfranchisement uh, and was courageous in the, in the litigation uh, solutions that she offered for them. Uh, she was really most proud of her work during that period of her career. She worked with uh, Deval Patrick in a lawsuit against uh, Jeff Sessions in Alabama. Uh, and she worked with, you know, with communities. Uh, she was courageous in that she, she, she moved across the intellectual um, um, uh, terrain. Uh, so she didn't just stick with voting rights. Um, she, she tackled all of the deep and, uh, and, and challenging uh, issues of the day. She tackled affirmative action, uh, education, merit. Uh, when she went to law school, she tackled the way in which uh, law schools train women lawyers. Um, so, so, so she, she, she she was a you know deep, um, deep, uh, deep thinker. We we all know that, uh, but also just not uh, not 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 constrained to any one area of the law, and that I think was was courageous. And of course, we all know she picked herself up after the Bill Clinton. Uh, fiasco uh, and, uh, and 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 went right back to work. Uh, and as a matter of fact, produced some of her best work. Uh, that was perhaps the best thing that could ever happen to her uh, was to be rejected by Bill Clinton and uh, and then um, return to her work. 
Uh, just to put a little bit more uh, detail around that, so she was nominated in 1998 by former President Bill Clinton for this role, as I said, the Assistant Attorney General. Uh, conservatives attacked her uh, viciously, and he then withdrew the nomination and sort of left her hanging. And uh, it was a national, it was a huge story, went on and on and on. Um, a lesser person would have been devastated, but as Margaret said, um, she went on um, and did quite well. So courage, again, why did you use that word, Marita, when you talked about Lonnie Guineer? I thought about, I actually thought about both of them, you know, confronting these kind of myriad uh, practices that came together to really maintain systems of, of oppression. Um, uh, and then she was caught, I thought, in this very public way we've just talked about. So no one was used to seeing African-American women, period, uh, in as much of anything, really. So the coverage of that whole issue with Clinton um, was, you know, drove through media on stereotypes. And then they quoted one another using stereotypes without actually going back to her original work. Um, so she was, she was honest and direct in really pushing forward her work, but she certainly didn't expect to be held up in this kind of way publicly, uh, excoriated for things she didn't say, we, we could go into later if you wish, um, and then move forward. And I thought that was an example uh, that we all really need, but it was important, I feel, to many, many women who followed her, who stood there and saw her absorb that, recommit herself to her principles, to the work she was doing, and to continue. Um, I'm switching to Bell Hooks now, starting with you, Kim, because she, you said, is uh, quite frankly a hero of yours, or was a hero of yours. Why courage when you talk about Bell Hooks? Well, I think, and similarly, um, I think Bell Hooks was courageous in that at base she was a writer, she was an artist, and she challenged um, she was able to stand up and challenge not only what might, you know, she challenged patriarchy, she challenged capitalism, she challenged imperialism. But the writer's job is to challenge um, all of us individually so that we could, you know, become what more human, right? Baldwin said the writer's job is to make us more human. And so she was not afraid to turn that challenge inward. She turned it toward, and by, by that, I mean towards us as Black people, right? As a Black community. And that takes courage, right? She had a critique for capitalism, imperialism, and patriarchy, and masculinity, all deservedly so. She had a critique of Beyonce. You know, that takes courage to, <laughs> to critique Beyonce, mm -hmm. right? And because in the service of of her love for black people, for black girls in this particular case, right? So she, that was extremely courageous to turn that same critical eye, not only outward, but inward in the service of the loving service of making us all, calling us all to our higher our higher selves. And that's the ultimate job of the artist. And that's what she was. Mm. Uh, Darren Duarte, you got a chance to interview uh, Bell Hooks um, and you too use the word courage. Yeah, she was courageous in so many ways, Callie, and you know, she took on so many topics you know, for the time. I mean, she took on white supremacy, she talked about feminism, and she talked with me a lot about love. And she thought we lived in a society of lovelessness, and if we could put love first and foremost in our lives, and not just the romantic kind of love, but the love where we had compassion and caring for each other, as black people and basically humankind, all mankind, we would be a much better place for. So here's uh, an expression that you all may have heard these days, and it's called, um, and young people use it frequently, for the culture. It reminds me a little bit of uh, what the expression folks used to use a while back when they described some uh, a black person as a race woman or a race man. And that is to say that these were people who achieved greatness in their careers, uh, no question about it, with all of the credentials accorded to them. But their connection to the community was foremost, that they never let that go. That was a part, that was the driver of their work. That was what they saw as their reason and their purpose for being. So I, I'd like all of you to talk about you know, what it means to be for the culture. And you can use either Lonnie or Belle as your example. I'll start with you, Kim. 
Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. I, I love the phrase race, race man, race woman. We don't really use it that much anymore, but I think we should. And Bell Hooks was absolutely a race woman. And I think Darren picked up on on one of one of her central things. Um, if I had to use courage, I would also use love. And it was love for black people that drove all of her myriad um, explorations into these other things to help us not only overcome, again, these external terrible forces of oppression, but the internal, the internalization of those forces of oppression, which is lovelessness and the ways in which we perpetuated that among ourselves. Um, and so she absolutely was uh, uh, for the culture and that she wanted us to have the courage not only to resist outwardly, but to explore inwardly. And I, I think that's the highest uh, um, call of a, uh, is that she recognized that we needed to nurture and expand our humanity as much as we need to fight oppression. We get very focused on that and it's necessary, but what is the damage that that does to us? Um, I mean, I, I don't think there's any greater calling, any greater calling for a race woman who than to seek to not only help us fight, but to also help us heal. And uh, Lonnie herself, in an interview that you did with her, uh, Darren, um, spoke very firmly about the fact that uh, she didn't want to be the only tenured African-American professor at Harvard Law School. Take a listen. Well, I don't want to be the first and only black woman at the Harvard Law School. Right. I alone, as an individual, no matter how um, impassioned and no matter how honorable, cannot change an institution alone. And yet many people, I think, have the sense, and this was implicit in your earlier question, that if we can simply get one pioneer through the door, that then the doors will fly wide open. And I think that's a fallacy. And yet we have raised expectations as to what that one individual might be able to do because she or he is now inside. Exactly. Darren, did you feel her sense of uh, frustration about that and, um, and a little bit of pain? Because, I, you know, we put a lot of weight on these people who have gotten through the door. Right, right. One of the things she also said, too, in that context was think about Dr. King. Uh, if Dr. King, at that point in time, became the secretary of HUD, would we all be free? No, no, it wasn't about that. It was about, it was about yes, having people like her in the institution, but you need more. We can't stop, we can't stop there. And I will give her this, one of the things she did, she did tell me back then was, if you have only one or a few, in some instances, instead of that individual changing the institution, the institution ends up changing the individual. Mm -hmm. I'll say on her part, that did not happen for her. And she kept kept on with, you know, voting rights, civil rights, and she taught a whole slew of students uh, over the over the years that those were important things to, to deal with in this society. And as they went forth in their lives, uh, hopefully that would be front and center. Well, that's, uh, Margaret, that's because she was for the culture. She was a race woman. She understood she was of the community. Well, yeah, I think that it's obviously true that, yeah, she's definitely for the culture. I wanted to say about Belle, um, that uh, Belle was also very much for the culture by calling out patriarchy in the African-American community. So, you know, Belle, you know, Belle, Belle was a, a pioneer in that sense, in that she was one of the one of the most effective and consistent voices uh, in pointing out to to us, to our own community, uh, where uh, where patriarchal uh, practices, longstanding patriarchal practices, uh, were harmful uh, to our to our people, to our to our women, to our girls, and to our community. Um, so, I mean, I think sort of having that, in, being able to have that internal, both a, be, be an external voice, but also to be an effective internal um, spirit and voice and intellect within our own community. That's what both of these, both of these women uh, brought to the table. Uh, and as far as Lonnie is concerned, yeah, Lonnie, um, uh, Lon, Lon, first of all, it's true she didn't, she, she didn't want to be the only, but someone has to be the first. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't have 
uh, President Biden announcing that it would be a black woman uh, to be the next uh, Supreme Court justice, had Lonnie Guineer and Derek Bell before her, who left Harvard Law School mm -hmm. because Harvard did not have any black female professors, uh, left and went to NYU. Um, so someone's got to sort of uh, take that first courageous step Mm -hmm. And it was Derek who did it, opened the door for Lonnie, uh, and then Lonnie, who then trained many of these women whom we saw on the CNN screen, uh, and maybe the PBS screen as well, <laughs> yesterday, uh, being announced as uh, potential candidates uh, for the next Supreme Court a position. So uh, there you have it, uh, Marita, in terms of that connectedness that uh, both of them felt very strongly about. Um, and with regard to bell hooks, let me just follow up something that uh, both Margaret and um, and and Kim said. Um, she was aware that the that that trying to get to that humanity, that piece of humanity, was really important uh, because without that love, it was hard to fight the battles, if you will. So let's take a listen to bell hooks again talking to Darren Duarte uh, when she was on a book tour here in Boston some years ago. I'm fundamentally passionate about justice and about freedom. And when you are passionate about those basic ethical issues of justice and freedom, it, it sort of moves over. I, I think of myself as almost being like a tree, you know, where the branches keep expanding, but the, the root of the tree stays the same. She's the root of the tree, Marita. <laughs> yes. Uh... <laughs> What, I, what I've liked about uh, thinking here about the comparison of these two women, we're both humanists, really. Uh, you, hear, you see that in Bell talking about love and really trying to understand how different people work, accept one another, move forward together. Uh, you see it in Lonnie uh, in, her, in her work to uh, move out of this idea of quota or you know, black voting block, but to really think that uh, the, the point was the issue of justice and whoever can get together to work together to reach that goal should be allowed to be together, should come together. So she has been, was misunderstood greatly in that area. But the point was they were really, they were humanists. And um, I like the example they set of people who are humanists who nonetheless are rooted in their black community. I mean, I think Lonnie has said that was the, uh, you know, the source of power, authority and legitimacy. The community, uh, and and let us not forget that that's that is the root we've been talking about earlier. So I like it that we're looking at two women um, who who married both of those things. When often uh, in our public discourse we want to separate that. You're either for everybody, you're either for the human race, or else you're for one race. Um, and this, these are examples of people who are forceful, uh, very forceful in representing their own races, but in doing that, embracing. Uh, the larger um, goal of, of equity and justice. So Margaret started the conversation looking um, out to uh, people who have been touched by the work of Lonnie and are now taking position because she was in place to pass on some of this. I wonder, mm -hmm. starting with you, Darren, can you note some young people who are in the path of a Lonnie, in the path of a Bell Hooks at this moment? Well, I, I think, you know, the position that she did not get that Clinton pulled her for in 93, Kristen Clark, I believe, I believe that's someone also in her path. Am I correct, Mark? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Right, so, absolutely. I, so, here, so 28 years, some 28 years later, that was 1993, um, yeah. a student of hers, a student of hers is in a position that at one point in she told me that was her worst nightmare when Clinton pulled that nomination. But here she nurtured a student who is now that person. I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty heavy right there when you think about it. That is true. Oh. Mm -hmm. And I think we can all agree, if people don't know Kristen Clark, not a shrinking violet, very much in the mode of, uh, I'm going to say what <laughs> needs to get said and talk about the inequities at every point. Um, Kim. 
Um, yeah, for Bell Hooks, I would say, I mean, Bell Hooks nurtured um, a, an entire generation of Black feminist writers and scholars and, and lawyers and activists, right? I think in, it, people and, and the people who are leading the movement at this very moment, I would think Kimberly Crenshaw and, and uh, on, the, on the law side and, and then on the scholar side, Roxane Gay and Amani Perry and all these amazing Black feminist writers who are uh, diagnosing the, the ills of our society and and you know um, prescribing the, the 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 solution, which is what both Lonnie Guineer and uh, uh, Bell Hooks did. I think it's really important to realize if we had listened to both these women, right? By, Bell Hooks talked about the lovelessness that's at the center of American society, as Darren said, um, and how Black people are are damaged by that. But but the larger society is damaged at it. And Lonnie Guineer, with her theory, um, with uh, Tor uh, Gerald Torres, I believe his name was, about the canaries in the coal mine, right? She said back then that, um, that what's happening to Black people in voting rights is, are we are the canaries in the coal mine for American democracy? And lo and behold, look where we were, right? So both of these women were prophetic in some ways, right, about how not only are these institutions and oppressive forces damaging us as, as Black folks, but threaten the larger American society. And so they have inspired a whole generation of scholars, Imani Perry, on and on and on, who are continuing to do the same thing. If, if, if We all know if, if America would just listen to Black women, we, we would be so much better off. <laughs> uh, Marita, pick up uh, folks that you see following in the path of Lonnie and Bill. You know, I, I went at it another way. I was I was uh, impressed by the point that people are always talking about who's the leader, mm -hmm. who's taking over. And what I see is a, a dispersed leadership. Remember the early days of Black Lives Matter when they said, well, who's in charge here? This isn't going to work. Nobody's in charge. Um, I think we see dispersed leadership. Now, whether it's in, in um, that particular movement or even uh, when you look at the January 6th uh, insurrection, um, I love it. That there's so many people who are prepared to step up in very who are empowered now to step up, um, particularly in these areas that we're so concerned about. They get so little attention, have gotten so little attention um, in areas of social justice and racial equity. Uh, but I hear many more voices than I used to hear. So it was bold for Bell Hooks to kind of name, you know, call Gloria Steinem, talk about Spike Lee. Um, uh, directly in her work, whereas now I think people are more willing to to call call the shots as they see them, uh, which I think is a a very good thing. Lonnie, in the same way, um, uh, as we've said before, pressed on and just made her points. And I think that example that I see in a lot of younger people, for sure, um, is heart. It's just you know, it's what I want. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I want to know someone behind me who feels empowered to to. Um, say what has to be said, because otherwise the decisions are all made by the same people. That, that's, that's what they left behind for me to see. Mm -hmm. um, nobody wants to give up decision-making in the larger society to people of color, to women. Uh, and these people took that on. And that's the, you know, that's the challenge we walk with now. So I, I'm tired of hearing, um, you know, we hired our first, whatever, black somebody. You want to say, who's the we? Mm. Who's, who's that we? Mm. Um, so I, I love it that that this uh, address to the core um, decision-making right that's been held so closely uh, continues to be battered and then very strongly these days. I think it's important to note, Margaret, um, you started this this uh, conversation about who's who's coming behind, but to put in place and remind people that Lonnie herself was inspired by Constance Baker Motley, that she yeah. saw Constance Baker Motley uh, there before Congress fighting for these, uh, for African Americans' rights to be, and thought, I want to do that. I want to be a lawyer like that. I want to take up this cause. Well, two things. I think, yes, Constance Baker Motley, when she was 12, she said she saw her on television. Uh, but also, uh, Lonnie's father was also a, a tremendous uh, figure in her life, her father and her mother. Uh, her mm -hmm. father was a Jamaican, uh, Jamaican ancestry, and her mother was a Jewish American. Uh, and Lonnie was one of three children. I, I know this because our families were close um, in, in the city. Uh, and, but her father was a, a lawyer, 
uh, he uh, got uh, one of the highest grades on the bar exam when he took it in New York, um, New York City, uh, and then was not able to build a career for himself as a lawyer because of the time uh, and became a union leader, a very, very effective union leader. She got her social justice heart and mind and spirit from her parents, uh, as well as from those models who were uh, barrier breakers at the time, like uh, Constance Baker Motley, and there were several others in, in, around her in New York City. But you know, this this is a family that uh, came from you know they I I visited the home in Queens. This, 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 these are humble people, uh, Lonnie. I mean, well educated. And, you know, um, it, uh, certainly you know, part of the world, but also this is not a rich family, the, the, the Guineer family. Uh, Lonnie went to public schools, uh, and then, of course, she went to the Ivies, and she put all of that um, to great use to the benefit of our community. Well, I think... Uh one of the things that that I hope that people can, ca can carry away from um, what you all have said, both of those of you who knew them personally and then others who just knew them from afar, is that the legacy is that they were connected and reached back behind them, brought forward, and intended to make it clear that there was still work to be done. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you so much for for all of your tributes. That's the end of our broadcast and the end of our show. Thanks to our audience for joining us. And now stay with us as we continue our conversation on digital platforms, Facebook and YouTube. I'm Callie Crossley, host of Under the Radar 89.7. We're on Facebook and YouTube with our post show, continue our discussion on the legacy of Lonnie Guineer and Bell Hooks. Um, uh, Margaret, you started on a path that I want to pick up on now, which is what were the internal and external forces <laughs> that they uh, were able to tap into? I guess resources is a better word. They were able to tap into to withstand the kind of uh, pressures nasty, vicious, I, we, were, we haven't been as explicit about the level of criticism that were aimed at these two. It was not uh, simple at all, and this is for a long time without social media. It was pretty intense. So what was, where do you think they got that internal fortitude? Margaret, well, you, you, I, go ahead. I, I, so, so clearly, I think they got that from knowing who they were, where they came from, right? Uh, and I know this is true for Alani. Uh, so you, 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 you know, a part of the uh, part of the uh, onslaught on Lani, they called her quota queen, uh, and they, you know, bad ideas, uh, crazy ideas, and crazy hair. Uh, so, you know, we know what that's all about, crazy hair, crazy ideas. Um, so uh, she saw this as an attack, not just on her, uh, but on black people uh, and on black women uh, in particular, quote, a queen, crazy hair. What are you talking about? You're talking about black women. That's who you're talking about. And so in, 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 in defending herself, uh, she know that she knew she appreciated that there was more than herself, uh, that it was more that about more than her. Uh, from the very inception, this was really about her, but about more than her. Uh, and so, oh, I so just, I, I think that's the, the core was just coming up. Her, her mother made a choice. Mm. She made the choice that Lonnie and her two sisters were going to be raised in the in in the bosom of the African American community, and that's a as a comp we all know it's a complex community, it's a beautiful community and ugly community, but it's ours, <laughs> and, and it was that it, it was really that. Um, I think that anchored uh, uh, Lonnie, uh, and also that was obviously reinforced by her early work 
in the South on these voting cases where she was working with community, with, you know, folks, local folks just trying to register to vote. That's who she was working with, the folks lining up, uh, trying to vote on Sunday, having that bottle of water on the lines. Uh, uh, anybody else want to weigh in on where, where do you think it came like, from? Well, I think we talked about courage before with Lonnie and both and Bell, but one of the things that she was disappointed with with the 1993 nomination when Clinton pulled it. Lonnie, you're was, talking about now. Okay, I mean, you're talking about Lonnie, yes. yeah, Lonnie. Mm -hmm. when, they, when they pulled it, she didn't get the chance to fight back mm -hmm. at the Senate confirmation hearings. She wanted to challenge those senators on the right and all the, the media outlets that, that pushed her to quote a queen. They said she wanted to have her voice and she didn't want to back down. She wanted to have her say, and the president didn't allow her to do that. So that was something that she was disappointed with. But yet she, she continued on and she kept, she didn't change you know, her thoughts or what her old law review article said. She just wanted to, she wanted to explain to people uh, the realities of what they were and what she meant behind them. And I thought, uh, I thought that was very impressive too. I thought it was interesting that she that she herself said that um, afterwards, a lot of people would come up to her if they recognize her at, out in public places and say, I don't necessarily think I agree with you, but I think it was totally unfair that you did not get an opportunity to be heard and that you should have been heard. And I wanted to hear what you had to say um, in defense. Mm -hmm. So I'll just put that out there. Um, Kim. Yeah. Well, I was thinking about Bell Hooks. I agree with everything about Lonnie, but you're about Bell Hooks. I think she, you know, she wrote often very, very openly about um, challenging from a very early age, even her parents, right? Margaret was talking earlier about her challenge to patriarchy, right? And that grew out of her, her own father's, you know, she said her parents cared for her, but they too were caught in the grip of, 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 supporting and endorsing and reinforcing patriarchal thinking. Um, and somehow she knew even at an early age as her father was beating her for acting like a, you know, acting like a boy, mm -hmm. that that was wrong. So, uh, you know, I, I think, I think her, her, some of her drive came from this kind of innate knowledge. I, I, again, I go back to her being a writer and artist. I think that's, you know, that where we're driven, writers and dr artists are born step, standing outside the systems, even your family, and going, really? Is this the way it's supposed to be, right? And having and having the courage to question that. And and the seeking. And the other thing I want to say about her that Margaret talked about is her challenge to patriarchal thinking was absolutely that it, it wounded black women and black girls. But what made her courageous is that she also said it wounds black boys and black men, right? She wrote a whole book about how that thinking damages black. And that was courageous because a lot of feminists were like, why are you concerned about, you know, men, right? And she's like, but they're, they're wounded by this too. And we have to reclaim them. We can't, we can't make them the enemy. Our black men and our black boys are, are need to be as healed as our black girls and her women. She was, she was fearless. I would actually say beyond courageous, almost fearless. Um, and, and, expose, and also exposing her own vulnerability and her own deep, deep desire to be loved, which I, I think is incredibly courageous. And uh, appearing to be able to come back against some criticism that was, I, I have to use the word vicious. I mean, yeah. there's criticism and there's criticism. You know, you're used to it if you're in academia as she was, but some of the stuff that went at her, that came at her was, was crazy um, in yeah. its intensity, yeah. so. Um, that yeah, I think she. And I just want to point I was out. Gonna that, say, go ahead. Mm. Go ahead. No, you go. No, ahead. I was just going to say. I think she she knew that uh, you know what, what they call a hit dog will holler. Yes. Right. So. Uh, <laughs> and and I wanted to add that um, she wrote a children's book, really about young black boys, so that she could put out into the world what she what what is the real story about. Uh, young black boys, as as she said, I, she never saw one reading a book, um, and to try to you know um, deal with some of the stereotypes that were out there and some of the some of that hurt that had been directed at them. Marita, yeah, Kelly, um, Kelly, I'm, I'm, she, so, oh, I'm so struck by um, excuse me, Darren. Uh, no, I'm, I'm so struck by the, um, uh, the the tender and soft sides of both of these women. Mm. You know, we've talked about how fierce they are. We've talked about their writing. We've talked about their courage in the face of a uh, really terrible onslaught um, and their commitment to to their work, uh, commitment to community. Part of commitment community was just that they were just real people. 
you know, that they didn't live, they weren't in a condo and, you know, they don't know where they weren't living in some off place. They were part of the community. They were, you know, Lonnie loved telling stories about Nico, her son. Um, she wanted to know where, where'd you go to get your hair cut, Marita? You know, where did you, you know, how can I get her, get my nails done with her friend? Um, uh, I think when you see Belle talking, you're sort of surprised by how soft she is, how, how gentle she, she appears when in her books. She, she seems to be some other woman. As Lonnie, you see her ability to kind of laugh, you know, to just absorb the fact that this is ridiculous. Um, but you have to have some kind of sense of humor uh, to do that. So I agree that the roots came out of all the things we've said, but they produced women who were, who were prepared to be uh, full dimensional, fully dimensional people. Uh, and I like that about them because it kept them in touch with all the things that we all uh, deal with all the time. Darren, you want to add something? No, I was wanted to jump on something you said when you talked about Bella writing the, the children's book and so forth. One of the things she did tell me was that a lot of her work came from things that she experienced or that she saw that were lacking in our society, like the children's books for, for black boys. You know, there weren't enough of them or the kind that she thought maybe they should have. So she goes out and does it herself. Those kinds of things. I just was going to mention that. Is there one thing that uh, about either or both women um, you all would like for uh, people to think about as they just um, embrace the legacies of both of these very fierce and impressive women? Um, what would you say uh, for somebody now actually just coming to know them after they have died um, and yet you want to to give them the essence of who they were from your perspective. So I'll start with you, Margaret. I would say for, for both of them, uh, <clears throat> rendering uh, what uh, we, rendering the unseen seeable, mm. showing us things that we take for granted for what they really are. And I would say for, for Belle, it was, again, the lives we lead in our gender roles um, that can be oppressive, but you don't see it unless someone shows it to you. Mm. And Belle did that. Mm. And for Lonnie, I was, what, you know, what, what she showed us was how, democ how broken democracy will continue to be unless we figure out new ways of allowing uh, vo so-called minority voices to be heard. Mm. Um, I mean, that was her large contribution was just, you know, look, th this is submerged. It will always be submerged. Um, these voices will always be submerged in the politic unless we see something different. Mm. So I would say that would be my, that would be the, what their contribution is, uh, is allowing us to visualize, uh, to see the water we're swimming in. Wow. Um, Kim. Well, that's hard to follow because I agree 100%. Um, I think that's absolutely right. Um, and, uh, you know, I think another link, that, especially with Lonnie Guineer, is this call to, and, and Bell Hooks too, this call to, to individual citizenship and civic responsibility. Mm. Um, for, you know, it could, would have been easy for both of them, especially Lonnie Guineer after that, you know, after she was thrown under the bus by Bill Clinton, let's call it what it was. Um, to, to retreat and to have a very cushy life, but she she did persist in in um, pursuing a larger responsibility. And Bell Hooks was public intellectual, but it was public because she felt that she had an obligation. And for Bell Hooks in particular, I would say her legacy to me most pressively is the is her willingness to treat the con the subject of love seriously and as a as a philosophical a philosophical statement. And as undergirding everything else she did, including teaching, we haven't talked about her great book, Teaching to Transgress, which I think is really important for transforming higher education. But even under even the, the under the foundation of that was love, not in a soft, silly American romantic sense, but in a really powerful, um, tough, and as Baldwin said, tough, brave, hard sense. Um, and as Darren said at the beginning, if if we could just do, if, if, if we could do that, if we could approach that, um, it would transform society. And I think that's what, for me, her, her most 
potent uh, legacy will remain. Her, her treating of love is a very serious inquiry um, and when necessary for everything else we do. Well, just to pick up on your piece about, uh, she talked about uh, teaching to tra transgress, meaning that in the classroom, she wanted uh, uh, educators to see that as a space of liberation. So yep. that's been passed on um, to now many, many, many students. Um, so we expect to see that somewhere else. That is her legacy then, because um, to your point, and to all of your points, it was never about just what she could do or what could, she could bring in one classroom. She was looking beyond that. Right. All right, exactly. Darren, for you. I think in both women, they both had a strong passion for what they believed. They both had passion for justice, for freedom, and I would say for both love as well. And when you have that, I think it shows as an example of what people can do when you stick to your when you stick to your guns and you stick to your passion. I mean, she, she, we talked about how she's taught many students over the years. I was struck by her son, who's now a law professor as well. He won a similar award that she she won some years back in Harvard. And he, on a videotape, on a video camera, told the students um, on her mother's legacy, basically, it's not just about what you can make of your career money-wise, but what you can do to help your fellow man, what you can do to help your fellow woman succeed in the society and become a better America, because that's what she believes in. And that's what he thought the students could best do to fulfill her legacy at, uh, at Harvard and, and elsewhere around the country. And we should note that he is now a professor at uh, Harvard Law School. And he also uh, just, you were mentioning the award, the teaching award that he won is the same one that she won uh, years ago. And right. it's quite prestigious. It's given to a professor by the students recognizing someone who has great talent in uh, teaching. Marita. Well, to these wonderful reflections, I, I think I'll add generosity. You know, the, her generosity of spirit in teaching in, in her, her, her need to really help us move forward as a group. Um, and I think they're both kind of idiosyncratic women. They, were, they had wow. very distinct selves. Mm. Uh, and it just says to all of us, whoever we are, we can go back into that core self. We can believe in that experience we've had uh, and we can contribute from that space. So that's short, short, sweet. Well, I thank you all for your insight and for these um, wonderful tributes to two fantastic, wonderful women who uh, have left us, as we say, too soon. Thank you so much.